to get everybody together and do some things to really thank you as well as give you the opportunity for the business that you do with, the, with our programs all the time. But we wanted to kind of celebrate our board members for all of the things that you do as well as um, take this opportunity to uh, celebrate some of the outstanding uh, people and programs that we'd like to recognize tonight as well. So basically, on our program tonight, we are going to start out with a presentation from Tom Johnson, who is the CEO for Elevate Rapid City. Um, he is going to give some economic outlook information and talk about kind of how technical education helps with some of the different economic uh, areas for our region. And then we're going to have the fabulous opportunity to hear from our, well, actually me next, and we can take an after that, that's okay. Um, and then we are going to hear from our um, Western Dakota Tech board chair, um, and uh, Mr. Mike Bressler, who is our chair, will um, bring you an update about our board, and we also have our foundation board chair here tonight, and she'll give you some She'll give you an update on some of the great work that they've been doing as well. And then we have the fun part where Tiffany gets to unveil all of the awards and um, prizes that we are um, recognizing folks with through our American Technical Education Association award process. So I will get this started and just ask Mr. Tom Johnson to come on up and get us started with some great news about the economic situation in the area. quick introduction, I was about to pop this uh, Pepsi open so I could get the caffeine oh. sufficient that I needed to, to give this speech, but she, she jumped the gun, so I'm going to go ahead and do it now if you don't mind. Uh, they said I'm supposed to entertain you guys for about 45 minutes, so I hope you're uh, ready for maybe 15. Um, before I start, I promise I'm not going to spill this. Uh, before I start, uh, I uh, should tell you right now, I, I should be having tequila with Dan Tribby. Uh, he had asked me yesterday to, to come with him and, and have uh, some tequila shots. Does anybody look, ever, does everybody know Dan Tribby? Yep. Yeah, okay. If you know Dan, you know that uh, Dan can, can drink. And so I should be there right now, uh, but I haven't texted him to tell him that I'm not gonna be able to make it, and I just realized. So if anybody who has Dan's text, uh, would you please take a picture of me right now letting him know that I can't make it. Uh, so he might be having tequila shots by himself. Um, that brings me to, to some, some, a couple lessons. Uh, I, I often get asked, you know, hey, you've been here two, two and a half years now. What, what have you learned as a, as a CEO of Elevate? And, uh, you know, a couple, couple things. Uh, Dan had given me probably some of the best advice I'd ever received in my, my life, frankly. You probably heard me give this uh, uh, talk where I talk about my dad when I was younger, giving me probably the best piece of advice I ever had in my life. He said, hey son, there's two kinds of people in the world, world those that are humble uh, and those that are about to be. And which one are you? He would always say this to me and I would always remember that I wanted to be the humble kind and every time I'm not, I, I certainly get humble. But Dan Tribby gave me some equally good advice in this job. One day, about, you know, probably three or four months into the job, uh, someone said, hey, you gotta meet this guy, Dan Tribby. So I did, of course, we had shots. That's what you and you, you meet Dan. And, uh, you know, he could see that I was a little bit uh, frustrated, and, you know, and I, you know, I decided to kind of bare my soul uh, to Dan. And, and, you know, Dan's not a guy that really likes to see a lot of whining or crying. And so I said to Dan, you know, so-and-so was upset and you know, this person doesn't like me, and so and so and so. And he said, you know, stop crying, stop, stop whining, here's a shot. So I took the shot, and he said, stop, stop, stop complaining, stop whining. And I was like, who is this guy? Uh, and, he, and he said, you know, listen, you just need to remember one thing. Uh, people are gonna criticize you anyway, no matter what you do. So it doesn't matter what you do, Tom, so just stop complaining. 
you might as well just do what's right anyway. Um, and so I always try to remember this job that uh, when you're in a job like this and when you're at the positions that you are in, uh, it doesn't matter what you do. There's going to be somebody that, that's going to criticize what you're doing, uh, but you still need to do the right thing anyway. And so as I give this presentation tonight, you'll, I think, hear that theme uh, throughout that we, we continue at Elevate Rapid City to try to do what we, we think is right, even if we uh, face headwinds. And the second thing that, that I've learned uh, in this job, is, and I thought I knew this uh, because uh, I, for those that know me, I know that I, I try to get up every morning and meditate. Uh, you know, there's this whole mindfulness movement now, you try to be more mindful. And I thought I caught the front end of that, that wave, honestly, five or six years ago. I learned to meditate. And so I, I generally get up every morning uh, and, and try to meditate for 30 minutes uh, so that I can be more present in, in my day. So if you've ever seen me get angry at you or, or someone else, you know that I didn't meditate that morning. Uh, but I try to be present, and I was reminded of this. Uh, many, many of you don't know that during this, this time of, of coming here and, and doing this LA merger, my mom, she got sick, and uh, she... she she had pancreatic cancer, and, and that's pretty terminal. And so she, uh, she had about six months to live when she got diagnosed with it. And so here I was uh, in, she lives in Riverton, Wyoming. That's where I grew up in and around the reservation. And so I found myself in this weird position of uh, doing this job, uh, hiding the fact, I don't know why I was hiding the, this fact. I think I was trying to be strong here. For me, with Dan, you know, you don't want to be weak, right? You don't want to admit you have any weaknesses. So I, I didn't want anybody to know that mom was sick. So what, was, what I was doing is I was finishing this job at five or six o'clock at night, uh, and then I would drive uh, to Riverton, Wyoming, which is about a five hour drive from here. And because my dad didn't know how to take care of my mom, I would take care of my mother from about 10 p.m. Uh, to, oh, let's say three in the morning. Uh, and then I knew I had to be back at work the next day at eight. And, and sometimes, frankly, I was a little late, so I got in at nine. And I saw it. I, uh, I hid this from, from many of you and, and the community and my, my staff members, and this this idea that I needed to, to be strong. Uh, but during this time, um, when I was taking care of my mom, I, I had a much a, a better appreciation of, of and what you guys do here when you, when you train healthcare workers. I didn't know anything about feeding tubes or being a hospice nurse or, or morphine patches or fentanyl. Uh, but I certainly learned a ton uh, during that process. And it, it, you would think when your mom's sick and you're, you're watching someone pass and, and it, it's, it feels like a sad event, that, that it's, it's kind of a downer moment. But, but this is what, what, what taught me to be present. Anybody, friends, uh, anybody fans of Elvis uh, Presley out there? Raise your hand. Yeah, yeah thanks. So my mom was too. Um, and in the middle of this uh, one night, uh, probably about a month before she passed, uh, you know, my, my mom, or my dad and my sister were also there with me. They were kind of arguing over in a corner, and what they were doing is they were trying to distract themselves from, from the moment, right? When your mom's sick, you want to forget about it, you want, sometimes you want it to, 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 to finish, and so you can get past this, right? But I, I tried to remember to, to be present, so what my sister and my dad would do is they would turn on the TV. And if you've ever done this to yourself at night, you know you can turn on something, and, and hear something in the background and sort of distract yourself with this noise. And so I, they, they kept putting the CD on and they kept putting shows on and my mom was sitting there and sometimes her eyes would be open and she might say something. But, but often there was just this sound and that didn't quite sit right. It, it seemed to me like that was really a distraction that we weren't really in the moment with her. And so um, my mom was a tough lady but she loved Elvis Presley and, and so one night my sister and my dad are arguing in the corner, and they've got this TV on, and it was on some, you know, Netflix thing where it just keeps going and going and going, and I'm sitting there next to my mom, and her eyes are kind of open. And I thought, well, what if I try something different? So I, I took the TV remote, and I, it was connected online, and I, I put it on a YouTube. And I thought, well, uh, I'll, shit, I'll just try to put it on Elvis Presley songs, see what happens, right? So, so I did that, my sister and my dad are still arguing over in the corner, and um, so I put it on, and Elvis Presley comes on, and I put on I don't know, his greatest hits, and uh, my mom's eyes just kind of open up a little bit, 
And I said, you know, hey, mom, do you, do you like that? And she didn't really have a lot of energy to, to speak or say anything else. But in that moment, just being in that moment with her, it, it, was, um, it was one of the, the most uh, treasured moments of my life because here's what she did. She was like, have you ever seen these uh, movies like Gladiator where the Roman emperor decides if who's going to live and who's going to die, right? And they do this. And then they get to the, you know, if he's going to live if, if it had this, this signal and, and the person's going to die if they give this signal. So my mom, she, she couldn't really speak or open her eyes much, but she had enough energy to, <laughs> this is so, such a thing my mom would do, to, to not nod or have anything else. What she did is she did this Roman emperor kind of thing, right? And she had all this power suddenly in this moment. She goes like this, puts her hand out, and I'm looking at her, I'm like, yeah? I don't know what the hell my mom's going to do. And, and so Elvis is playing, right? And she's, t she's about to tell me what, what she thinks, and she goes like this. <laughs> That's it. And then I saw a little tiny smile <laughs> kind of break on her face. And so I... I said, oh my God, I, I had this connection with my mom, almost a connection that I hadn't, I can't, I can't remember a time in my life, I'm sure there were, but this, this connection that I had, and it was, I realized that this, this, uh, this trauma that my family was going through, and that I was going through, and that I was hiding from all of Rapid City and my staff, was actually a gift. It gave me this opportunity of time uh, to spend with somebody that I cared about, and that moment, I'll, I'll never forget it. It was, it was so powerful, and I felt so connected to my, to mom, my mom. And, I came back with a renewed energy uh, for this job. And, and so as I, as I go through this and I talk about this, I, I, I just want you to, if, if you can take any lesson from, from that story or what I'm saying today, is that you can, you can bring this attention to the moment. You're going to be working with, with students and, and you're going to be working to, to try to, to find a workforce and train a workforce. And you're going to be lost in this moment of trying to get from place to place. And, and do your job. But if you can, take that time and, and that moment to be present while you're in, in that job. And I tell my staff that every day. So anyway, as I'm giving you this 45 minutes, you can see I've already, got, I've already given you 10 minutes of entertainment here, so I've only got 35 more to go. I want you to know that I'm going to bring that kind of intention into this. So I, I, I appreciate you letting me tell you that story because I bring that kind of uh, passion and to, to this work. But let me tell you a little bit of stuff you already know. Uh, you've probably heard before, uh, Elevate Rapid City uh, has been around for a few years. Uh, we were a partnership of the Chamber of Commerce, Economic Development Partnership, uh, the Economic Development Foundation, which is now the David Lust uh, Accelerated Building, or we like to call it the, the D-Lab. And, and by the way, I, I lost my mom, and then soon after I lost uh, David, my, my chairman. So this was, uh, has been quite, quite the, the year and a half for me. Um, and then we were also a, a partner in with the South Dakota Ellsworth Development Authority. We provide $200,000 of funding uh, to Sedita every year. So it's, it's quite the partnership. We're pretty unique. Um, there, there are a lot of groups across the country that combine their Chamber of Commerce with their economic development group. But we're one of the first, first to do two incubators, economic development, a development authority, and smash them all together. And by the way, I didn't even put our 501c3 on here, so we have that in there as well. So we do get called quite a bit. Calls from across the country, cities and rural areas saying, hey, how did you guys do this? Because our reputation, I guess, has gone far and wide at this point, which I'm real proud of. But we were formed in January of 2018. Uh, community leaders like yourselves, I see many of you in the, in, the, in the audience, a couple of you on my board, you were there when this happened, and you decided to have this kind of vision and form this, this new organization. Uh, we had a six-sentence mission statement uh, when, when I got here to Rapid City, and I'm proud to say that we, we took it down to seven words. Uh, and uh, I couldn't remember the six sentences. I don't remember what it was. It was sort of like, Elevator Rapid City will do this, clause, 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 word, 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 clause, clause, clause. It's one of these mission statements. <clears throat> you know what I'm talking about, where a consultant comes in for a day, and you do strategic planning, and you all get little uh, colored post-its or, or Play-Doh, and you vote for things. Well, that's what happens. You end up with a six-sentence mission statement. So we cut that down, uh, and we just decided we're going to elevate the region for everyone not uh, the white collar technology worker over the trades, not the good old boys over the Native Americans. Everybody needs to be lifted up by our work. So that really uh, galvanized our mission and what we, we do uh, for this community. And I think it's helped us to get our mission right. You've probably seen on YouTube the, 
the talk by Simon Sinek, Sinek or Sintek, I can't remember his last name. It's uh, Start With The Why, he's got a book too, he makes a million, billion dollars off this book, Start With The Why, but he's right. If you can get the why, why do you exist right? If you can get that right, uh, everything else falls into place. We've got a short vision and core values as well. Uh, you've probably heard just uh, this talking before, but I just wanted again, just stress that getting the mission matters more than anything else for us. Uh, this is the uh, framework we used uh, to do the merger. <clears throat> Don't want to spend a lot of time, but you can tell at the very top, you can see a little box called uh, recruiting and business attraction. The big mistake most communities make uh, across the country is they think that they can recruit their way into prosperity, so they start there. They don't, start, they don't start at the foundation with leadership and public policy and education and workforce, which is the stuff you guys all do. They don't start with these foundation building blocks. They think they just go right to the top and try to recruit. And they're unsuccessful. And then their CEO, uh, guys like me, uh, they lose their job in about three years. We've, uh, even though uh, we were formed in 2018, I didn't come on board until 2019. So we're actually ending our fourth year and starting our fifth year of our first year uh, five-year campaign. And I'm proud to report that uh, our five-year goals uh, have, have been reached. Uh, and I, sometimes you get lucky. So uh, with COVID and coming out of COVID and some of the inflation, it's allowed us to hit some of these metrics faster than, than we probably deserve to but uh, we're gonna take credit for it anyway. Uh, so the, the goals of the board uh, when they started this thing in 2018 was to create 4,000 jobs, increase wages by 15%, uh, increase annual consumer spending by 125 million, and then reach 300 million in CapEx a year. So roughly where we're at, uh, or where we were at at the end of the year in 2021, uh, we've hit the 4,000 jobs, wages have increased by 26%, and again, some of that's due to inflation, but I'd like to say some of that's due to our work as well. Uh, we absolutely obliterated uh, the consumer spending mark. In fact, I told my board, I said, hey, you know, we probably ought to set our next uh, goal a little bit higher because we're, we're really crushing that one. Uh, and then finally, the 300 million in CapEx. We set a record last year uh, for capital investment in the Rapid City area. My guess is that we're gonna destroy that number again this year. So we're excited about the fact that we, in four years, reached our, our five-year goals. Uh, this is our org chart. Uh, you don't really have to pay too much attention other than to know we've got pillars. So when you had four different organizations before, you smash them all together into one, the books, the finances, the board, the culture, the staffs, et cetera, you end up with pillars or divisions. Uh, ours are economic development, which is primarily responsible for recruiting companies to the area, but also expanding existing companies to create jobs. Innovation and entrepreneurship which is all about You've seen our new building in downtown, uh, built by uh, Skull Construction, real nice building. Uh, that was originally supposed to cost, um, and this has nothing to do with Skull Construction, uh, this, that was supposed to originally cost around nine to $10 million. Uh, I checked yesterday and we're right around 14.6 uh, million. So inflation is, uh, is a real bitch, no matter how you, you measure it. Uh, but uh, we have this incubator and we intend to use it. We're going to get our $14 million worth, I'll, I'll tell you that much. We're going to get companies in there and incubate them out. Uh, we also use it as our corporate headquarters. We're figuring if we're going to have this nice of a building, we might as well get a few offices out of it, ELT. So uh, we'd love for you to come down and, and see us down there. If you'd like to, just send me an email or just drop in. Um, and, and we'd love to give you a tour. It's an amazing facility. We get people from all over the country uh, looking at that thing. In fact, we had a uh, a, co a company from Silicon Valley and also a company from the Boston area, that sort of MIT corridor, come there and say, you know, we, have, we, we don't see stuff like this in, in, in our area. And so it's a real attractive uh, facility for us. But we do that to do uh, innovation entrepreneurship. Uh, we also have a division that does workforce and talent attraction. I'll go through some of the stuff we're doing, but we have workforce grants for, for trades uh, to match Dakota scholarships. We're also doing a big healthcare recruiting campaign. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. But our, we have an entire division devoted to trying to fill this workforce. Um, and it's hard. Rapid City has one of the lowest workforce participation rates in the entire country. It's lower than 62%. Uh, meanwhile, our unemployment rate has set record lows as well. So our unemployment rate has never been lower than it is in its entire history. It's about 2.3%. 
And there's a little bit difference between unemployment and labor force participation. Unemployment is those that are looking for work can't find work. So 2.3% of the people looking for work can't find it. And when you get, you get that low, you're sort of almost at zero statistically within the margin of error anyway. Labor force participation is a little bit different and economists actually think it might even be a better measure of how your economy is doing. Labor force participation is, hey, anybody who's over 16 who's not in a, uh, a mental ward, uh, how many of them are in the workforce? And so Rapid City has a really low labor force participation. I'm often asked, you know, why is that? What, what, do, you, what do you do to fix it? And there's a couple of reasons for it. The first is uh, we have a, 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 a I want to say a, a senior population because I, I don't mean I don't mean to be negative about it, but 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 about 65% of the people that are moving to the Black Hills, and I'll show you the numbers in a little bit. 65% of the people moving to the Black Hills are 65 or older, and so they're choosing to come here because of our low taxes and our quality of life but they're not choosing to participate in the, in the labor force. And so the more of those folks you have moving here, the less labor force participation you have. So that's a challenge for us. It's also an opportunity. Those folks bring capital. Uh, they bring uh, wisdom. Uh, they bring mentorship opportunities. A lot of them are former CEOs and folks that we can take advantage of to be mentors. And, and we've got a mentorship uh, program that we're gonna launch to try to take advantage of their, of their labor and their smarts and hopefully get some money out of it too. Uh, so we're, we're going to launch that, but we, we need to get them more involved. So that's a strategy that we need to employ. I mean, we can sit there and we can bitch all day. Oh, you know, we got too many seniors coming. They don't vote for school bonds, blah, 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 blah. Or you can just deal with the facts of what you have and say, hey, we need to embrace that. Uh, the other reason we have a really sm uh, low labor force participate, participation rate is that uh, we are in and around several reservations. And those, those folks that come and shop here and drop money in our economy, they're often more transient. And they're also choosing not to participate in our labor force. And so that's an opportunity for us as well to try to get them into the labor force. Uh, I, I think I was talking to Andy Skull a couple of times in the audience a couple of weeks ago about some of these efforts. Uh, we're even going into places like the Cornerstone Mission and trying to see you know, how can we get some of those folks that are in crisis into our labor force and, and, and being productive members of society. Because when you're at 2.3 unemployment, you don't really have the luxury of just saying, hey, we don't care about whether you're in there or not, you know, here's a bed. Um, and so I was downstairs in the Cornerstone Mission. And by the way, it was right before I got COVID, so I don't know if there was a correlation there or not. Uh, but I uh, did get COVID a couple days later. I was uh, down in the mission, and there were about 100 people down there. I guess they heard uh, that I was coming to give a speech, and I didn't know my, my reputation uh, went into the Cornerstone Mission, but there were lots of people w wanting to hear me talk, and, and I talked to them about my experience when I was younger. Uh, my mom had me when she was 15. Uh, my grandmother was, mur I grew up on a reservation. My, my grandmother was murdered when I was eight in the trailer, if you can call it a trailer, next to me by my grandfather. So I had quite the upbringing, but also means I was very poor and I was on the street. And so I sort of understood their, their lived experience. And so uh, maybe I identified with them, but I, I, I got to know these guys, and, and, and the Cornerstone Mission is, by the way, one of the most diverse places you'll ever go. If you're looking for diversity, go to the mission. There's uh, African Americans, Native Americans, Caucasians, you know, everybody you possibly think that lives in Rapid City, they're, they're in the Cornerstone Mission, so it's a very diverse place. But anyway, I said to these guys, I said, hey, listen, um, we're told that you all don't want to work. We're told that you, you don't want a job that you just want handouts, you want freebies, you know, is this all true? You know, I wanted to see what they had to say. They said, not at all. I said, well, how, there were like 100 people there. I said, how many of you, if you knew that you had an opportunity to get a job or, or, or someone offered you a job, how many would you take it right now? And I'd say about 85 of the 100 went up. So 85% of the folks in the Cornerstone Mission said, hey, if I, if I, if I could get a job right now, I would. I, I want a job, in fact. And so we start breaking down uh, these reasons as to why they're not able to find a job or get a job is one, they don't know where to go. They don't have access to uh, online resumes. They, they, don't, they don't have a, even an ID. Sometimes these folks lose their ID. So there's basic things, transportation, the stuff you and I take for granted, they don't know how to navigate these systems. And you might say, well, that's their problem. Well, well maybe, but 
also, again, uh, we have a 2.3 unemployment rate, and so we, we're trying to find workers everywhere we can get. So we're trying to figure out how Elevate can use its resources to break down these barriers to get more of those folks who may need to get their GED or may need to get some kind of trades training back into the workforce. Um, you know, some of these folks have mental health problems, but there are legitimately some of these folks that are trying to get back in the workforce and they just don't know how to navigate this and we're trying to figure out what can we do. Uh, one guy even had this idea, he said, you know, it'd be really cool if, you know, people that need welders or laborers just had a little board down here in the basement to tell us what was available. And we said, wait a second, you don't? There's, there's nobody that tells you what jobs are available down here? Like, no, no, no boards or anything? No, just a, just a kind of board that gave us the opportunity. We said, hey, let's write that down because that's, that's low-hanging fruit for us. And so it's just that basic stuff that we're trying to break down. Anyway, long tangent. We have some other divisions too besides workforce. Small business, I was told when I got here from the, the folks at the chamber, hey, don't you forget about small business, don't you forget about Main Street, don't you forget about the mom and pops, you don't forget about that. So we don't, we have an entire division devoted to that. We also have a business advocacy and quality growth division. Anna Hayes is our director of uh, public policy. She is in peer right this second, tracking about 20 bills, trying to get bills that help technical colleges to get nurses. Uh, she's, she's tracking a housing a grant uh, that we think can come to West River to help us uh, as well. And so we do a lot of advocacy and, uh, and efforts around quality growth. In fact, we have our Cracker Barrels and thank you for hosting them here. Uh, I was at one uh, last weekend and I, I didn't realize they got so contentious sometimes. So uh, that was quite interesting. Uh, it was interesting to be pulled, pulled aside by Julie Freimuller in the back and have a, you know, get a talking to from her. So uh, that, that was interesting, and, and Ann, thank you for help hosting those. But, but that's, that's democracy. It was great to see a bunch of people come. And even if they're arguing and, and seeing my face and wanting to punch it, it's still good that they want to have a conversation about where our future should go. And I'm really fast, I can run too, so it's cool. Uh, and then finally, we contract uh, to the tune of $200,000 a year to the South Dakota Ellsworth Development Authority for all things military. So anything related to keeping the base happy, keeping the airmen and women happy and their families happy and housed, we work with our friends at South Dakota Ellsworth Development Authority. We really appreciate what they do for us, and that's why we fund them. So that's our org chart. Sorry to spend so much time. Uh, we also uh, are, I think we're a high performance organization. We have those five-year goals, but every year we break down our five years into one-year work plans. And you can see each of the divisions has a purpose or a why, and then targets and outputs. Uh, I first learned this from John Wooden, actually, uh, when I think I, I, I think I might have been getting my master's degree at, at some point. Somebody brought out Coach Wooden, and you know I knew about him. I knew he had won all these championships in basketball, and I knew he was the coach of Bill Walton and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and uh, but I didn't know, I didn't know about him. I just knew he was a successful coach. Well, it turns out he had a system. And, and one day he, early on in his coaching career, he said, you know, I can't control often whether we win or lose. He wouldn't think he would say that, but he did. He said, you know, one, sometimes, sometimes we get a team that was the most talented team and they might make a lucky shot, the other team, or we might get an injury and we would lose. Sometimes we had a really mediocre team and we would win the championship. So he knew there was sometimes things you couldn't control that would can control the outcome of your result, you could win or lose, uh, but you might not be in control of it. That's the same thing in economic development. You all expect Elevate to control the economy, um, and we accept that, so we're gonna measure our targets and our goals, uh, but I would tell you that the price of oil and what's happening in Ukraine right now and interest rate hikes are gonna have probably more to do with this economy than what we do, and so there's things outside of our control that might not allow us to successfully do some of the things that we, we want to do. But there's also things in our control that we should measure as well. So Coach Wooden would say, hey listen, you can measure how hard you practice. You can actually control how many free throws you shoot. You can do certain things that hopefully have a connection to your targets, and so that's what we do at Elevate. So for example, last year we had a goal of recruiting five companies to Rapid City. Uh, we hit that goal, we got six. But we might not have been in control of that destiny. I remember the first time I was working with a, with a big company, and this is back in my days in Wyoming when I worked for the governor there. 
We got down to the end. It was 150 jobs, uh, and it was between us and Iowa. And who the hell wants to live in Iowa, right? So I thought we had this thing whipped. And so the, the site selector came and said, hey, we, we would like to choose you, but we're not going to. And I said, whoa, 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 wait, I was not prepared for this at all. What are you talking about? I, I can't hear that. I'm not going to hear that. No, you're, you're coming here, right? He said, no. Nope. Uh, he said, uh, you guys are the lowest cost state. It's where we should be if markets were efficient. So I said, well, that's great. You should be here. And he says, but we're not because this spouse of the CEO doesn't like your shopping. And so I, I thought, well, crap, crap, I can't just go recruit a big mall right now to get, get them to come here. So to see, things are out of your control sometimes. You think that at Elevate, we actually are in control of some of the stuff we're not. Uh, so it could come down to this things like, hey, you don't have a Chipotle or you don't have a Chick-fil-A, what the hell's going on? So stuff like that that you might not even think of. But the point is that we try to measure both the things we can control and the things we can't control on every single division that we have. But we still, still subscribe to the idea, uh, this old maxim in economic development, I was taught this when I was about 27, uh, this old boy pulled me aside and said, hey listen, here's the secret to economic development. And honestly, it's a secret for you. I'm gonna give this to you for free, okay? Uh, he said, shoot at everything that flies and claim credit for everything that falls. And so to this day, I still do that. Notice I can, can claim credit for all those numbers. I'm still doing that to this day. So that's a secret I'll pass along to you and in your, your audience here today for free. What else are we doing? Uh, we've, we're in downtown. I just told you about our, our nice facility. But we're, we're trying to make that an innovation district. You've got the South Dakota mines at one end. You've got uh, sort of this Block 5, 5th and St. Joe's at, at the other end. You've got our new uh, David Lust Accelerator building at D-Lab uh, and a triangle. So it's a, it's a triangle, if you follow me, and we're going to work extensively on trying to make that an innovation district downtown. Here's some things that are going on uh, and have been going on. So uh, I just told you about the D-Lab. Uh, Hanny Shaffey did the KC Lofts. The city's about to do the fire station and make that uh, a really cool place. I honestly, when they showed me the drawings a week ago, the, the fire, fire guys, firefighters, fire admin guys, they came over uh, and they weren't in their gear, they just looked like me. Uh, and they said, hey, look at the, check out what we're gonna do for this, uh, this cool building. And, and it looks kind of like that. And, and the inside even looks even cooler. It's the kind of place you wanna hang out maybe. And so I didn't think a firefight, a fire station could look that cool. Uh, but it does, and so that's going to be part of it too. Property Mill, who's a company that we incubated out of our incubator, our first incubator, uh, started with one person. Then he went to th Ray Hespin. He went to three people. Then he went to five, uh, and then I don't have enough hands to count where he went to from there. Forty, and he's at fifty, and he's doing his corporate headquarters in downtown Rapid City right now. Uh, he just got the building built last month, and I'm proud to say there's going to be 150 jobs that pay probably on average above $75,000. Uh, the elements, if you've seen the construction going up in downtown, they're happening right now. And then block five uh, is, is going to break ground probably in the next three or four months. Uh, if we can get this uh, cold weather out of the way, that's going to be uh, a, a big deal as well. So a lot of stuff is happening in downtown. It kind of reminds me of when I was in Denver, you'd see cranes on the horizons for as far as you could see. Not quite the same, but it's a different time in Rapid City. Uh, we also, if many of you probably read our magazine, each month we put out a magazine and we try to feature quality of life stories. Uh, the one we just did last month was all about dogs. So uh, <clears throat> I was in film school for a while. I was a screenwriter. In fact, the other day I told a group of superintendents, uh, it was like the Black Hills area of superintendents. Uh, I told them my Nicolas Cage story. Uh, and I'm happy to probably tell it tonight, but I don't know if I can tell it out loud or not. But I told them my Nicholas Cage story. They didn't know that I had been a screenwriter. So I was a screenwriter in Los Angeles, and one of the first things they teach you in screenwriting class, it's kind of a secret, they pull you in the room saying, listen, if you want, you want people to buy a movie, you put a dog in it. And so I took that lesson <laughs> into this magazine and said, hey, if you want people to read your magazine, just do a whole damn issue about dogs. And so we just did. So if you want to know how you can uh, participate in the dog-friendly environment that is Rapid City, or as we said in our cover, Bark City. Uh, check out our newest magazine. If you uh, can't afford it, just come down to the office. We've got a bunch of them sitting there. Go up, grab one for free. 
We also put out a monthly set of economic indicators. Uh, I'm just gonna walk through a few things that we track for you. I talked about our labor force participation. You can see that on the top right. Unemployment in the middle top. Uh, we, talk, we track our MSA population as well. What does MSA mean? It stands for Metropolitan Statistical Area. The census says this is what your trade area is. It's Pennington and Meade counties. So they think our trade area is that, and they think our population estimate right now is 149,000. When we work with site selectors uh, and big uh, national retailers, whether it's Barnes and Noble or a hundred other that you've probably heard we're working with, by the way, all those rumors are true. You've heard we're working with them, we're working with them. Uh, we, we use a bigger number. In fact, we had a site selector from one of those big publicly traded national chains say, oh yeah, your, your, your population is only 149,000. 40, 149, he said, that's bullshit. It's actually bigger than that. We had to go get credit card data from the hospital to see where people are spending money and where they're coming from. And we did the analysis, the trade area of Rapid City, South Dakota is actually much, much bigger. It's a 36 county, five state draw. And it's about 425,000 people. So this trade area is, it, it, it bats much, bit, much bigger than its weight. We draw from a huge regional center. Uh, that's why healthcare is, is the second biggest industry is because people are coming here for their healthcare, they're coming here to shop. And so we start giving that data to these national site selectors and these retailers, and they start saying after a while, uh, well, the first thing they say is, hey, stop bugging us. Uh, and the second thing they say to us is, oh my God, we didn't realize you guys are so big. And so we're getting much more yeses now. Um, if I told you who's coming, I'd have to kill you, it's all confidential. Uh, but just know that we've got a bunch of them coming. Um, the, the national names that you've been wanting to get into Rapid City, all you ladies out there, they are coming, except Whole Foods, I can't get them because that's just not something we can do yet. We have a half of a bigger population, but the names are coming and it's because we're using the actual trade area with a bigger trader. Okay, went on another tangent again. What else do we track? Uh, we track employment and wages. You see that 921.74 number? Uh, last month that was 936. That's your average weekly wage in Rapid City. That was a record. It's never been higher in our history. And when we used to talk to these, some of these site selectors, they'd say, hey, you know, you're kind of a dollar store town. You know, you just, you're more of a Walmart town. And that, all, that didn't sit well with me, honestly. I didn't like that. So we started showing them some of the income data. data. And, and at first, uh, about a year and a half ago, we were behind Billings, and we were behind Bismarck, and we were behind other areas that had some of these retailers. And so what we started to see is, and it wasn't just a pandemic thing, it was literally Rapid City's employers, as we were going to them and saying, hey, you know, you might want to think about raising your wages to be more competitive. They were doing that. We had Monument raise their wages across the board. We had several banks raise their wages across the board, even pre-pandemic. And so you started seeing wages in Rapid City rise to the point where about nine months ago, we caught billings. And last month, we were $100 ahead of billings. So that 921, that 936, guess what? Billings is 100 bucks behind us. Even with all this inflation, we're literally, everybody says literally. Everybody says, have you noticed that? Everybody's like, literally this, literally that. But in this case, we're literally $20 behind Sioux Falls at this point. I cannot wait in the next year where our wages surpass Sioux Falls so we can do a press release and rub it in their faces because they think that we are a tourist town and we're not. Uh, we, we are, but our wages are rising and we're gonna have the highest wages in South Dakota and, that, and we're going to do a press release on this. Uh, the point is that our wages are, wages are rising so we're showing this data so that people are starting to change their perception about Rapid City being just a tourist, low value, low wage uh, area to a place that has amenities, and, and a higher value to them, because uh, that matters to these national retailers. Uh, we also track listings and housing uh, prices. I don't need to give you the data to tell you that what you already know is that it's getting more expensive to buy a house in Rapid City. We break it down by zip code, so you see, if you can't read that, there's three zip codes up there, 57701, two, and three. So it w does really depend on where you live, which zip code you live, in how expensive your list price is gonna be. So this is the idea that, you know, oh my God, housing's so expensive all across the Black Hills, oh my God, oh my God, it's a, you know, the sky's falling. 
That is true. Uh, when I first got here, the average list price was around 232. This was about two and a half years ago. Uh, that number's been pushed up to well over $350,000. Thank you, pandemic. But it also depends on kind of where you live. So there is some affordability in pockets, but I will submit to you that it's, it's getting tougher and tougher to find. On numerous occasions, the Wall Street Journal has put us in the top 20 hottest real estate markets in the country. At one point, we were num literally, we were literally number two in the country uh, for hottest real estate markets. I think last week they had us at 17. Uh, that that comes with a um, so some good news and bad news. If you're a uh, seller, that's great, right? You sell a house for for a, for a tidy sum. Uh, if you're a buyer or you're a family trying to get into the workforce or you're in the trades and you're trying to find a house, a little bit tougher. So what are we doing about it? It's probably gonna be your question. Uh, we recently hired a housing coordinator so that employers have a place to turn and developers as well. So, and if any, any of you and your, or your employers or your representative industries are trying to find housing for your employees, you can call all the way. There's somebody on our staff, her name is Laura Jones, who I hired her last month. Uh, she's devoted 24-7, 365. We actually don't give her time off. She, she has to think about housing all the time. She never gets any sleep. All she can think about is housing. So we try to help people find housing. We try to connect them with the developers who are, have housing units coming online. But we also work with developers, too, to access grants and other resources and TIFs so that they can bring housing stock. So we're, our mission is twofold there to bring more housing to the area, not just single family, but multifamily, but also to, to, to sort of bring more stock on, but also get those prices in a range uh, that's more affordable. Uh, you can imagine as a builder, if you had the choice of building um, affordable housing or, or, or let's say a $500,000 house, which would you choose? Um, I would submit to you that you're going to go for the $500,000 home, not because you're a bad person or you're greedy, but just that's where the margins are and there's a, there's a, there's a collateral safety to you as well. So what we've got to do is partner with the private sector, the nonprofit sector and the government sector to create more opportunities for uh, developers to do more of those lots because it's hard for them to just say, hey, I'm gonna go build a bunch of houses in the 225 range you know, and lose money because right now it's probably gonna cost that developer more with the lot, the infrastructure and the build uh, to build those kind of homes. Okay, we also track uh, gross sales every month we are getting closer and closer to a, a record in Rapid City of a billion dollars in gross sales in one month. Um, that is a lot. We are we're regularly hitting 750, 800 million a month. It's not a year, this is a month. Every single month, we're above 700 million. So we're setting records there. You can see the, the 12 month change. Hotel occupancy is up. Uh, building permits set a record last year. Valuation set a record last year as well. We're tracking new housing starts, uh, but we also track the commercial real estate market in terms of the rental rates. Uh, and then also, uh, finally, we track ag. We had some of our Aggies uh, in the chamber say, hey, you don't track any ag statistics. And I said, well, what would you like me to track? And they said, well, track cattle and corn. And I said, okay, that's fine, we can do that. So we did. Um, I didn't think much of it other than I, you know, I've got to, got to make these guys happy, right? So we'll track this stuff. Uh, but it actually ended up being a real good reflection of inflation and an indicator of what was going on inflation because it, cattle and meat go into a lot of stuff and corn goes into corn syrup and other things as well. So you can see the cost on the right, but on the left you can see the 12 month change for feeder cattle, 18% over last year increase. And then on corn, 21%. So if you don't believe there's inflation, well, you're just, I don't know, you're drinking tequila, too much tequila. Okay, this uh, gets a little more into your specific wheelhouse. I just pulled this data as of two hours ago of what the top postings in the last 12 months. So we have some pretty sophisticated data. I know I've been here before and I've shown some of you are databases and I've actually done requests live on this computer so you can see some of our databases. Uh, I don't think I can do that tonight, but I pulled the real-time data that exists as what's going on in the market. So this isn't stuff that the census tracks or the, that the state tracks and it's a 12-month lag. This is real-time postings that are happening in the marketplace over the last 12 months. We have access to all of them. And you can see what is being 
needed in the workforce in the Rapid City MSA, that the Pennington Meade County. You've got registered nurses, uh, retail salespeople, truck drivers, uh, consumer, uh, customer service reps. This is where I wish I had my glasses now that I'm in my 40s. Uh, sales reps, uh, frontline supervisors, laborers, freight, stock, and material movers, uh, fast food and uh, something workers. I can't read that. If you can read that, thank you. Uh, LPNs, uh, et cetera, and then health service managers. And so this is what's being sought in the marketplace. No shock to me or you that there's this overwhelming need for nurses. And so we thought, well, we, we need to do something about this. And so we're working with the big three providers, uh, Monument, Black Hill Surgical, and Rapid City Medical on a campaign. We have access to big data. So what we did is we layered a bunch of stuff. We layered where are the graduates in nursing going once they leave South Dakota. So if you go to USD or Black Hills State or any of the colleges in South Dakota, where are you ending up as a nurse when you're outside of South Dakota? We've got access to all of that data, Minneapolis, Denver. Not only can we tell you where they're at, we can literally give you their phone number, cell phone, their email, their name, all their skills. We can, we can give that to an HR director and actually mass email these folks and say, hey, come back to South Dakota. So we layered that data. We also layered that on top of where are we seeing immigration to Rapid City? Which counties in the country are we seeing the most immigration layered on top of that? We also layered it with data of all the counties that are within 100 miles of flights that are directly into Rapid City. So for example, Denver, Minneapolis, Chicago, 150 mile radius, all those counties, we layered that data in. So what are we doing with the data? Uh, well, it gets pretty creepy. Uh, we're, 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 we're taking that data and targeting those folks on their social media feeds, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. I don't know if we're doing TikTok, I'm not a big TikTok user, uh, but I don't know if you are, or Snapchat, but we're targeting those folks with all those layers with a link and videos to this landing page where we talk and tell the stories about what it's like to be a nurse or a healthcare worker in the Black Hills. So it's one of these things where, hey, you should come here. It's amazing, our outdoor quality of life, wages. You can see what we're trying to send, uh, what kind of message. So we're targeting uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of potential healthcare workers not just nurses, but uh, medical assistants, med techs. Uh, there's five different occupations we got, the ones that the, the big three wanted the most, and, and, and frankly, the ones that you are helping to train uh, were targeted to come to bring them back to Rapid City because we have such a shortage. So that's one of the things we're doing. Uh, wage trends. Uh, you can see over time, uh, the wage has kind of stayed where it's at. It, it went up at the end of 21, when you saw that big inflationary pressure uh, to find work, as you saw it get above 26. Um, I had a guy call me about five months ago and he said, hey, man, I just, Tom, I need you to run some data for me. I said, yep, tell me what it is. He goes, I need you to run what someone with a high school degree is getting in this market because we hire people that have those high school educations and we just can't get them for 14, 15 anymore. It's not just, I just know that I've got to pay 17 to get these folks. And I said, well, you know, my instincts tell me that's true. Let's run the data. So we ran the data. Uh, and this is, this 2197 is for all uh, education levels. So bachelors, masters, PhDs, no high school. It's everybody lumped in, so it's 21. But when we ran the data during that October, November time frame. Uh, the, the, the wages that were being sought or the wages that were being offered in Rapid City were something like 1660 to 1680 an hour. And so I brought that back to the guy and said, yeah, absolutely, your instincts are right. If you want to be able to keep those folks right now with this kind of environment, you probably do need to be at 17. So we were able to give them that kind of data. And we can access this kind of data all day long. Uh, for, for, and for you and, and your group, if you need wages in specific industries or, or um, occupation codes, we can do this kind of stuff. And this is just something I pulled just today. Uh, these are the historical numbers. So I showed you what's going on in the marketplace. This is the last um, 
five years, the highest ranked occupations in terms of the numbers of jobs. You can see some of those have lost jobs in the last five years. So look at the top one, retail sales persons, sales people. God, I really don't have my glasses right now. Uh, retail, retail, retail clerks. We're, we're actually losing those numbers, even though it's still the number one profession by total numbers. And you can see the earnings on the right. So what we do when we're trying to target uh, specific professions, we'll, we'll go in there and look at the highest median earnings with the biggest demand and, and try to see what we're, we're seeing there. Um, so you can see that that's, it's, a, it's a cornucopia of different uh, demands, but nurses are still in there. They're really high on the list. I was, I was interested to see the carpenters made that list as too historically uh, and some of the trades as well. So Andy, you guys are doing it. My guess is if we were to match what you're doing uh, with this list, it's going to match quite, quite extensively. So we have historical data in terms of what's growing, what's dying. And you can see some of those industries, even though they have a lot of jobs, they're being automated and they're losing jobs. Some of these things that are, that are a little bit lower in terms of total jobs, they're growing by a certain percentage uh, that's much higher. So for example, uh, you can see um, registered nurses, 16% increase. Not as many as the retail, but retail has dropped by 18%. And then if you look at the earnings, the registered nurses, 29, 19 an hour versus the retail, 1258. So you can start to get some of this granular data as well. And we can tell you not just stuff about this, but where people are being hired. We can click on and out, and go up and down, any, any place you want to go. Um, they asked me to talk a little bit about what's happening in the Black Hills right now. And I'm sorry for some of you who heard me say this over and over and over and over like a monkey. But right now, before the pandemic, or not right now, but before the pandemic, there were about 2,000 people moving to the Black Hills just because. I don't know why. Low taxes, they like mountain biking, I don't, beer scene, I don't know why they came here, but they're coming here at the, two, at the rate of 2,000 people. And some people ask me, you know, what do you mean by Black Hills? Well, you know the general area, I'm talking about that five county region of the Black Hills, that 400,000 uh, kind of base. 2,000 people are moving here. That's about six, six people a day. So uh, I don't even think we have six people at a table. But imagine one of your tables walking into the Black Hills uh, every single day. Every single day of the year, that's what's happening. Um, you know, we just announced a big battery manufacturer that's going to add up another potential 1,500 jobs. Uh, I mean, you might have heard this thing called the B21. Uh, that's, that's common, maybe, uh, to the area. That's going to add another 16. 100 jobs, and then somewhere between over 10 years, 7,000 and another 10,000 people. So if you start to do the math, my first degree was in English literature with a minor in Latin. Uh, well, you're not gonna find a job, by the way, with that degree. Uh, and so I had to go back and get a master's in finance to actually earn a living. Remember I have a Nick Cage story, I was gonna tell you that's why I don't have a job. But uh, I did have a job, I, I'll tell you that someday. But anyway, you do the math, that's, you know, just, just say, let's say 10,000. Two people are, 2,000 people are coming here a year, 10,000 in the next year, you divide 10 by 10 years, that's another 1,000 people, so you take two plus one, that's 3,000 now people coming to the Black Hills a year. Over 10 years, guess what? You just increased your population by 30,000 people, and that's probably a conservative. It wouldn't shock me if in the next 10 to 12 years we see 40,000 people flood into the Black Hills. I know many of you out there say, no freaking way. I can't handle that many Coloradans. I can't handle that many Texans or Californians. I can't handle it. Well, they don't necessarily come from there, but, but yes, there are going to be that many people coming to the area. Um, I sometimes get stopped by, by folks who, they, they lean a little more right and they just say, hey, you know, stop the growth, we're gonna stop the growth. And I'm like, God, I, I really wish you could, but unless you buy up every piece of land in the area, you're not gonna be able to turn it off. The day base is coming, whether you like growth or not. Um, so you, it's not even a question of whether we're gonna grow anymore, if, if that ever was a question. It's a matter of how do we influence that growth? Can we keep the quality of life uh, that the Front Ranch has lost, frankly, through through some of the things that we're trying to do at Elevate and some of the stuff that you, you guys are trying to do here. 
And we know with that growth comes the challenges of any place that's ever faced growth. Infrastructure, traffic, childcare, housing, land use, and, and water. <clears throat> We've recently talked a lot uh, at Elevate about the need to be more regional. And that means a regional uh, comprehensive plan. It's not, a, a, it's a dirty word to talk about planning in the Black Hills a lot of the time. But I'm telling you, if we don't start doing that, if we don't come up with a, a way to have our a, a regional transportation system, a regional housing plan, a regional water system, if we don't stop talking to our, our, our neighbors about what does growth look like as we push outside of Rapid City into Pennington and Meade counties, we're going to continue to see uh, the challenges that that brings. We're gonna see uh, maybe this group spend this much on a water system, maybe $10 million, and then this group spend another $10 million on a water system. They probably could have got a water system that served both for 12, but they spent 20 million in taxpayer money. You're gonna see that kind of stuff. You're gonna see more things like what you've probably read about in the newspaper with that shooting range. It's in Meade County. You're gonna see more of growth going into the county and rural neighbors with good intentions saying, hey, not in my backyard. Well, if you own the land and there's no zoning in Meade County, guess what? There's no way to stop that. That's a private property issue. People can do whatever they want, right? So you're gonna see, I think, more and more desire to try to figure out what fits and what's compatible. If we don't do that, that that's just the tip of the iceberg. You're gonna see more and more of these conflicts as we push housing into the rural areas and we don't have infrastructure, as we push businesses and business parks into these areas. So we've gotta get our brain wrapped around what does that look like and come together to, to try to think about what the region's gonna look like uh, in, in 10 or 20 years when we don't have so much water. One thing I've learned uh, from my good friend Cheryl Chapman uh, is that it would only take about three or four years of drought right now for us to face some serious water issues just, just now and, and, and start to really affect the aquifer in which we get our, our water. So these are the kind of things that, that I spend my time thinking about. That's, that's, that's kind of the long-term tenure. What's happening right now, uh, I am worried about, if you've read the economic indicators, you know I'm worried about interest rate hikes, four to nine of those coming in the next year. Uh, the possible inverted yield curve, I'll show you that in a second. Mortgages are starting to rise above 4%. Is that gonna cause a housing slowdown? Or even worse, are we gonna have a situation in which it's more expensive to buy a house, but our builders still have the cost of inflation sitting here, so you've got the worst of both worlds, the cost of, 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 of borrowing and buying a house and the builders still facing that inflation at the same time. That is not a good look for us. I wouldn't encourage anywhere to wear, any, anybody to wear those clothes. That is a tough one. Um, and then if they raise interest rates, that raises the interest on the federal debt. Um, and then the question is, you know, does, does Rapid City lag 10, 12 months behind that? Traditionally, we have. Uh, can we possibly miss it with that base? Those are all things I don't have answers to. If I did, I'd, I'd be much uh, more wealthy than I am now. But these are the kind of things that, that we're gonna think about. Just to get that into perspective, here's a curve of inflation. So on the far right, that's December of 2021. See how high it is? We haven't seen inflation like that's 7%. We have not seen inflation like that since the 80s. Uh, when I was a kid, and my dad told me these mythological stories of a guy named Paul Volcker, who was the Fed chairman, who had to come in and raise interest rates to 20%. Uh, people in my, kids in my generation, I'm not a kid anymore, but millennials, Gen Z, they don't even understand what it's like to be in an interest rate climate of 5%. So can you imagine in 1981, in which you were getting a CD that yielded 14%, but you were gonna go and, and have a mortgage that was 18%. That's the kind of stuff that we're seeing with inflation right now. So the feds are gonna have to do something with interest rates to try to tighten down that inflation. And the question is, can they do it uh, in, a, in a way that's tame um, and, and can they calm inflation with a couple interest rate hikes? I don't personally think so. Uh, so you can see some weird stuff happening in the next six to nine months. Uh, the Schiller P.E. ratio, I don't expect you to know what this is. Uh, it is a reflection of the value of the stock market. You see that red dot where it says 35.99. If you can't read the 35, just know that it's 35. The, that's the, the price per earnings of the stock market. The average over time has been 15. We're at 35. You see to the left of that, you that little higher peak, 
that was the crash of the dot-com era in 2000, in which this ratio had gotten to 44. It was the highest ever been, highest it's ever been. Right now, we're sitting in a place in which it's sort of the second highest it's ever been in the history of the stock market. That number can only go down. It might go up for a little while, but it's gonna crash at some point. So I am also worried about this uh, as well. I'm sounding, like a, a, I'm sounding like a pessimist at this point, man. I don't mean to, but I just want you to know that this is a possible scenario in which you have people flee the stock market and try to figure out where to put their capital. Which brings us to uh, the treasury bonds. Uh, if you can see the two year treasury is going up and up and up. I've given you data from October in which it was 0.29% uh, and now uh, within a short period it's at 1.53%. You might say, oh, that's not big, that's not a big deal. Well, it kind of is. Look at that seven year number and you start to see the two year number and the seven year number merge closer together. The, 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 the seven year number is 1.97%. Uh, uh, what that means is it's, the, the, the federal government is going to offer you higher yields on your short-term money than your long-term money. If that curve that you see where I put those arrows, if that two-year gets above the seven-year, what the federal government is essentially telling you is there's a recession that's going to be coming because they think short-term money is going to give you a better return than money that's going to mature in seven years because they don't trust what's going to happen in the five and seven year window. That's called the uh, inverse uh, yield curve. And right now it's, it's been going, when, when things were good, it goes like this in a real nice formation. As things start to get closer and closer to recession, it inverts and goes like this. So over time, I expect this to, to start to go like this. And if it ever inverts, um, I will immediately pull my money into cash. Uh, and I will not be in the market for sure. But this affects the rest of the economy. Uh, it affects mortgages, it affects spending, and it's something that, again, I think we have to be aware of, and it's something that the Fed uh, is gonna have to really navigate in a really fragile, fragile way. Okay, enough doom and gloom. Let me give you more doom and gloom. Kidding, it's not that. Um, some future trends. I was talking to the school uh, superintendents about this for about an hour. Uh, and we got to talking about how robots are gonna t overtake your life and they're gonna be your, your masters at some point. Uh, a little bit of a joke there, but we're facing a lot of automation. If any of you have been into any restaurants, you know it's getting more and more automated. You're seeing these retail establishments becoming more and more automated. Uh, we've been talking to uh, Chipotle about coming to Rapid City and they're now going to roll out uh, potential restaurants that don't actually have any people at all. You're going to drive through the drive through and you're going to get your order and it's going to come to you and you will use your card or your Bitcoin or, or your shiv or whatever the hell you've got and you'll pay and you'll never see a person and your, your food's going to come out. So you're going to see more and more automation. Uh, I, before this job, I worked at Colorado State University and one of my jobs was I was the uh, Business Development Officer for CSU Online, it was a long title, it felt pretty important. Uh, what I would do is I would go around and talk to businesses along the front range. And so I would talk to some tech companies and they'd say, hey, we get a lot of our computer scientists from Colorado State. I said, yeah, uh, great. And they'd say, well, it's not great because 24 months after they graduate, their skills are obsolete. So you spend four years or five years, depending on how much they've been drinking, uh, getting their computer science degree and now within 24 months that's worthless and we've got to teach them things and so we thought well that's an opportunity for us to make more money we will send you we will sell you a, a, some training now to give them more soft skills and then the employee would come back the employer would come back and say wait a second weren't you supposed to train them in soft skills when they got out and we're like well yeah but we don't talk about that much right we talk about the stem stuff and so what we're realizing is no matter what degree you have, no matter what trade you come out of, you have to integrate soft skills, critical thinking, problem solving, and if you can, a modicum of in, uh, EQ or emotional intelligence, because here's what's gonna happen. Uh, and any degree you have, it's, those skills are gonna erode. You're gonna have to learn how to learn. 
So if you don't know how to think or how to learn, you better learn this. Uh, there was a book that I read uh, many years ago from a, from a kid that was uh, going to MIT. It was actually about suicide because a lot of kids that go to MIT, they come from high schools where they're the valedictorian. Well, when you get to MIT, guess what? You're just a part of the, 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 the average crowd at that point. So it causes a lot of them uh, to, to, to commit suicide because they're no longer, they don't think to say their lives is valuable. That, that was about the, the point of the book. But there was a chapter in there in which the guy goes through his first day at MIT and he writes in this chapter about, you know, the value of the MIT edu education isn't that I get a degree from MIT. It was that these professors teach me how to think about learning is the important thing. And that's a skill I can have my entire life. In fact, he talks about a story in which the professor walks in and says, you know, these, these are a bunch of 18 year olds. I just got out of high school. And I don't know about you, what you were doing when you were 18, but I certainly wasn't thinking about this kind of stuff. Uh, I was probably drinking shots, tequila shots somewhere, I did no good, didn't attribute at the time, but I was still probably drinking heavily. And so this professor walks in and he says, hey, here's a tile, and this tile got burned off the tip of a NASA spaceship, and they don't know why, okay, but, what do you guys think? And he throws the tile on the, on, the, on the ground. And so these 18 year old kids, you know, have this first realization that they're expecting us to think about a problem in a different way. It's not, I'm gonna read the book and get the answer and, and regurgitate the test. I actually have to learn how to think about learning and solving problems myself. And so what I'm trying to tell you with that story is that this is the future of work. This is the future of education is teaching students and kids how to think about thinking. And it's more important than what you teach them to do, in fact, and it's going to become more and more uh, important. Uh, you're going to see also a menu approach to education. There, there is right now uh, a war going on in higher education for the souls of students. Uh, and it's being waged by everybody from southern uh, New Hampshire to Phoenix to even Saylor University, Michael Saylor, the guy who owns a lot of Bitcoin, you probably heard about him, he's kind of crazy, he talks about Bitcoin all the time. He's actually trying to do a free university in which anybody in the world can get a bachelor's degree for free in any subject. And so you're gonna see this battle for education and resources, that's going to happen, uh, and it's already here. You're gonna see more agile organizations and teams. We do this at Elevate uh, ourselves, even though we're a nonprofit. As I told you, we don't lock ourselves into a five-year work plan. We have a five-year strategic plan, but we pivot every single 12 months. So we've got a work plan for 12 months, and then we pivot if we need to, and then we pivot. So we divide that five years up into work plans so we can be more agile and react to the market versus locking ourselves into a, I've seen organizations lock themselves into a strategic plan for 20 years. Think about how ridiculous that is. You think you can predict the future in 20 years, uh, and really, as a human being, you probably can't predict what's gonna happen in 12 months. You couldn't have predicted COVID, you couldn't have predicted the rise of smartphones, you can't predict Jack. And so if you think you're gonna predict something that's happening in 20 years, you're wrong. And so you've got to be more agile, and you're gonna see more and more groups do that. Uh, remote work is here to stay. Uh, you're just not gonna get away from it anymore. Zoom is here to stay. Once workers got a taste of being able to work from home and work on Zoom, it's going to be hard to get them back in the office and say, hey, I need you here from 8 o'clock till 5 o'clock. And they say, hey, take a hike. Somebody else down the road is going to give me more flexibility, so I don't have to work for you. There's going to be that, that issue. And that's why we're going to have an arms race for talent as the labor force participation rate shrinks. As we get more and more boomers who decide to retire, that labor force participation is going to shrink. And because we're not as liberal, and I don't mean liberal in the political sense, uh, I mean liberal in terms of just giving out more. We don't have a, a robust visa program as we used to. We, don't, we can't import those workers to take up those, those to, to account for those jobs that we're losing. So you're gonna be seeing more and more pressure as companies have to compete for talent in the future, which means we're gonna have more free agents uh, that employ lifelong learning. I do this right now. So the magazine I told you about, I could have hired a staff writer. We could have hired somebody for, for 40 or 45,000 and given them full benefits. We don't do that. We just contract out with a free agent. We say, hey, write this story. We can get them for about 12 bucks an hour and pay about an eighth of the cost. 
and get the same kind of quality. You can do that with marketing now, you can do that with assistance, you can do that with all kinds of jobs that you normally would have to hire somebody to do, and you're gonna see more and more of that. Because of the retirees and the, and the boom in healthcare, you're gonna see, or excuse me, retirees, you're gonna see a boom in healthcare, you're already hearing about the renew renewable energy uh, fad that's going on, it's not a fad, it's gonna to continue to happen. Oh heck, I'm at the end. Did I carry, did I carry this for 45 minutes, Anne? Yeah. And you said you lead time for questions. Happy to take the questions anybody has, uh, or, or thoughts, or, or criticisms, or, or if you want to debate me, we can do that too. But I wanted to thank you for the time, and to let you know what we're doing at Elevate, to give you a little sense of what's gonna happen in the future. But mostly to come here again and thank you, I've been here a couple times, to thank you for the work you do. Uh, we couldn't elevate the region without your assistance, the trades, and, and the areas that don't often get focused on by the, the mainstream educational system is the place that you guys shine. And if we don't have those kinds of workers, uh, we're not gonna have an economy at all. So, so thank you for what you do. And I just wanna say that, uh, that my, on behalf of Elevate, uh, we're, we're excited to continue to work with you and partner with you and, and your, your organization, so thanks. Yeah, yeah, we do. We do. We, we, we're seeing some interesting data. I, I was on a, uh, I was giving a, a talk yesterday on Zoom to uh, a group of folks across South Dakota about the, the child care crisis. We didn't talk talk a lot about that, but we have this health care workforce crisis, which which bleeds into the child care crisis. About ten percent of the the workforce that has left are women who have left the workforce because they can't get child care. Um, and so that's why we were talking about that. But we do have some data, some interesting data on, on, on those jobs that aren't being filled and, and, and who they are. Our suspicion is several fold. We think there's a, a, a group of people who uh, were in the workforce and they're not quite at retirement age. So let's say they're, they're, they're younger than 65, uh, but let's say they're 60. This actually describes my father. My father, pre-pandemic, pre was working as a food service of America driver. I don't know how he does this. He gets up at three in the morning and drives this route between Riverton and, and Billings, and then back in the same day, and he falls asleep for 10 hours. Um, and he was that guy that he, pandemic, they said, oh, everybody, we're locking down. Oh, God, they, they laid him off. So he got some of the pandemic money and unemployment, and he was living off that. And at one point, he said to me, Hey, Tom, don't tell anybody, but I'm making more than I did when I was working. This is great. I think I'm going to keep pushing this out a little while. So, you know, my dad's going to be mad now. I just gave him a secret, but uh, maybe somebody's going to try to get that money back. But he decided that at post pandemic, that he had made enough during the pandemic with the, with the stimulus and the unemployment benefits that he could really ride this out and see what was gonna happen. So we have some data that I think demonstrates that there are a lot of folks, maybe you wanna say 55 to 65, but definitely 60 to 65, who maybe they were a little uh, concerned about the pandemic and what was gonna happen with the second wave with, with uh, Delta and, and Omicron and all that. They were kind of staying out of the workforce uh, because of that, but also because they could just hold out and they didn't wanna go back in the workforce. My dad was one of those guys, he, he held out for a long time uh, just because he, he had the money and he could live off of it before he decided just last month to come back into the workforce. So we're hearing a lot of anecdotal evidence that there's a group of, of, of uh, I guess you call them seniors, who are in that boat where they're, they're now just starting to matriculate back into the workforce, but they were choosing not to, to come in for a little while, which is why I think you heard a lot of panic in the news about, oh my God, we can't find workers. Well, we're starting to see now more workers come back in, but it was taking a while. So we think there's that, that population. We definitely know that there was also a population of, 
of mostly women who, who could not um, figure out childcare and how to get back into the workforce as well. And this is not really a political issue, uh, but it's, it's an issue of basically uh, childcare workers are paid in Rapid City and across the country, let's say 12 bucks an hour. This is, it's not a high value job in our society. So when they saw wages start to rise, these childcare workers could go work fast food and make 14 bucks an hour now, 15 bucks an hour. So they're like, hey, why should I go work with kids all day and make 12 when I can go get benefits at Target for 15? So we're seeing childcare workers leave, which is putting pressure now on the childcare providers to raise their wages, which guess what? That put pressure on the rates, which then made it more expensive to get childcare. It's this vicious cycle that keeps repeating itself. So we're, we're seeing a certain population, and again, mostly women, who looked and they said, wait a second, it's actually the cost of childcare is more expensive than my rent. So why would I why would I go back into this workforce thing when I don't know what's going on and things are a little strange and we don't know where things are going to be when when the cost of putting my child in childcare is more than than going back to work. So we're seeing I think both of those populations kind of revolve around this. I think the the narrative that you saw in some of the articles, which wasn't really supported by the data, is oh these millennials they're so lazy. And they decided to sit on their couch and play video games and buy cryptocurrency with their, their paychecks. That, that we didn't see a lot of evidence. And certainly, there are a few of them. I accused my son of that, frankly, uh, six months ago. But he, this, I was joking around with him. We just don't, we're not seeing a lot of evidence and data that supports that. We're seeing more data around those other two populations. But, but there is this kind of fun narrative that, that, you, that anybody can spin that, you know, these lazy millennials, they just don't want to get back to work. I hope that I hope that out. Yeah, sir. Oh, they're called Acer Technologies, A-E-S-I-R. Um, and if you want more information, um, I didn't do that deal. When you become a CEO, you, get to, you don't get to do the fun stuff anymore. You gotta actually manage people and their emotions all day. And, and they fight with each other. And I, I spent all my day doing that. So we've got a guy who's our FML development director, Matt Bruder. Who, I used to do that in my previous career, it was fun. Uh, now he gets to do all the fun stuff, but if you give us a call, we'll get you the details if you're interested. Uh, but yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's called Acer Technologies. Guys, thanks again for being with, for being, let me be with you tonight and to have, uh, have a great rest of your evening. Thank you.
And then a couple of weeks ago, we learned that we made the top 45 cut. And so we participated in the interview um, there and we're waiting to hear. In a couple of months, we'll find out if we made the top 10. So it's pretty amazing. The college in South Dakota that you have heard about that got the Aspen Prize a couple of years ago was later the Tech. So I think it's very balanced in Western Dakota Tech. It's as far as you know, geography in the state goes with the technical colleges. Um, then I also want to give a real shout out to the um, great work that has gone into our Bellwether Award um, preparation again. Western Dakota Tech competed with our Student Success Coaching Center this year um, project um, for the Bellwether competition. And this is the second year that Western Dakota Tech made the top um, 10 in the area of finance, planning, and uh, use of resources. So that is awesome. And we have a team that will be going to compete this weekend in San Antonio to see if um, we win that category and get, uh, get the top place there. Okay, those are my two big points that I wanted to make, in addition to the fact that we do have an awesome silent auction going on with our welding students in the back, in the area where it's the entrance right there. So go check that out if you haven't already. And I would like to ask our um, board chairman, Mr. Mike Ressler, to come up and just provide a couple of remarks. Johnson is always um, uh, thrilling and also very informational and, and a little bit humbling. Um, he, he, he gave a lot of information that, um, for me, uh, my, my job as uh, the board chair or, or a trustee, um, we're concerned with, with what the college does and uh, we're sort of staying in our lane here. And, I just want to explain that uh, for, I don't know, 40 some years, actually for most of its entire existence, Western Dakota Tech was under the governance and oversight of the Rapid City Area Board of Education, which was seven members elected basically to run the school board in Rapid City, but they had additional duties out here. And so a couple years ago, we were able to break away cleanly and start our own board of trustees. There was legislation that enabled us to do that. And we're, we're under the South Dakota Board of Tech yet, but there's four technical colleges in the state, uh, one out here and three East River. We are the first to do it. Um, and of course, uh, since we're West River, we wanted to do it right. And we wanted to do it well, and, uh, and we have. So we're off to a good start. We have nine members, and uh, we have members from Belfouche, Wall, Hot Springs, uh, and Phillip, and uh, some more around the city. We've got three new members. Andy Skull is one of them. Um, but uh, our board, our board members are uh, our board of trustees is here to support the college. Is here to support our president, and uh, she really deserves to have a board that is working for her, not a board that just comes out here as a as a kind of an extra duty as was before. So we've got that much accomplished and uh, that's working very well for us. And our goal and our vision is simple. We're just committed to growing the college. Um, so, and the other thing I wanted to mention was, um, I have a favorite quote that has occurred uh, to me for tonight's remarks and it came from our, our late governor, George Mickelson. And the quote, that he had that I admire so much is, the work gets done by the people who show up. And so uh, this workforce development thing, we can, we can talk about it and talk about it and talk about it, but what really matters is the how of workforce development. And so the folks here in this room, the folks that work here at this college, the people in the industry, 
We're the ones figuring out the how. You are the ones figuring out the how. And I just want to thank you for doing that because we can talk about workforce development all day. The governor can say she supports it. All these people can have platitudes about it, but it's actually doing it. And it's actually figuring out that, you know, the work I do today isn't going to pay off for two or three years. It's not going to matter until these kids are actually out of uh, Western Dakota Tech and on the job. So we've got visionaries. We've got people that take advantage of the Build Dakota scholarships and other tools, and there's more online, there's more coming, and we'll figure this out as we go, but um, that's really what I want to do, is just thank you all for participating in that part of it, and helping us put workers in the field, because that's really what we want to do here. So, thank you very much. for being here this evening. Um, in, in passing, I've heard a few people say, what is the foundation? So that's what I'm going to share with you guys tonight. Western Dakota Tech Foundation is a nonprofit organization governed by a board of 11 directors. The board is made up of community business leaders from the Black Hills area. With an expertise, passion, and belief in higher education and a stronger economy. The foundation has three employees, and they were all able to join us this evening. Um, Nora Linen, who will actually begin her foundation duties as of March 1st. Welcome aboard, Nora. We appreciate you coming on. And then we have Jenny Best. <coughs> She's the Assistant Director of Scholarships. And Jenny will speak here later about the Build Dakota Scholarship Program. That's where her expertise lies. And then we have um, Andrew Kapileski who is a scholarship coordinator. And if we provide scholarship opportunities for the different trades across the Western, Bo Western Dakota Tech programs. Um, under the board's direction, our foundation director and the different committees from our board manage the foundation's fiscal policy, the strategic planning to achieve our mission, vision, and values. The foundation strives to support Western Dakota Tech's mission by building a community that makes positive cons contributions to the college. These contributions help create scholarships, develop programs, build infrastructure, and create a com campus community where students, faculty, and staff find success. Now, in the last couple of years, we completed our 80-20 student emergency endowment campaign. And this is a campaign that over two years we had to raise $80,000 to receive a matching donation of $20,000 from the South Dakota Community <coughs> Foundation. We completed this just this last November. Yay, I think that's round of yeah. applause. <laughs> it was pretty exciting. It was the it was the day before um, Danita Simons, our former director, left, so that we were pretty excited. But these funds will be used for students with emergency situations. When they find reason to give up, we want to be there providing them hope. So those funds will be used for that hope. I want to thank each and every one of you for all you do for Western Dakota, for making this a great place to get an education and a great place to make a difference by sending our students out into the community. Um, as Tom said, there's a need for all of them. So thank you.
And I know a lot of you I have seen me come into your advisory board meetings and give you some stats about where we sit with building code. But tonight I wanted to give you a little bit more information. I promise I will not take very long. Um, before I get started, though, um, I thought it would be great for you guys to hear a testimonial from an industry partner. We have amazing industry partners, um, but Denise and Wesley Chapman from Black Hills Tire were gracious enough to um, let us come and record their story with Bill Dakota.
to to do this. Like, it has been just a piece of cake. Jenny and her team help with every part of it, and we um, haven't had we don't have any but good things to say. It's super easy. And if you guys have any questions, please reach out to us. We'd be happy to to share our story with you.
business is if you sponsor a student, you pay a portion of the tuition, Bill Dakota pays the rest, and then like Tanise and Weston were saying, you sign a contract with that student. They have to work here in the state of South Dakota for three years in that field. Well, you can have them as an employee for those three years, and it just kind of builds that pipeline of skilled employees coming to work for you. So these are just some of the numbers. Last year was cohort seven. We, uh, applications are currently open right now for cohort eight. Um, we did expand the foundation. And by doing so, we were able to increase our applicants by 119% last year. We increased um, our industry partners by 166% last year. And we increased the sponsorships by 120% last year, which is awesome. Every year, Real Dakota will match up to $375,000 in industry sponsorship dollars. Last year, we ended up at $243,000, so we ended up with an additional $486,000 that we can award in scholarships for cohort eight this year. So this is kind of where we're sitting uh, about two days ago, uh, the numbers are a little bit updated. I'm excited. We have, uh, well, let's see, not 39 anymore. We have 41 potential students um, to be sponsored. And that is because businesses have come and said, I want to sponsor five students or four students. And we have 31 partners that are interested in sponsoring our students. So they either have someone they're looking to upskill or they have, they're, they're looking at and reviewing applications right now. And to become a sponsor, um, again, if you've got an employee that you want to upskill, that's one way you can sponsor them to come to Western Dakota Tech and go through one of our programs. Or we give you access to review the applications every single year. And then our recommendation is, as you reach out to students, you do a job interview, you treat them like they would be an employee. You want to make sure it's a good match because you want them to stay with you for that three years, and we don't want those students going into debt conversion. So we recommend doing a job interview, bringing them out to your location, those kind of things. And the last part of Build Dakota really is working with um, all the economic development groups. Um, I was really excited today. A customer called. We had an industry partner breakfast what, a month ago, maybe? And um, she is super excited to have us come out and present. She's got 15 businesses coming that, she, that are interested in Build Dakota. And so that's one of the reasons we work with them. And then like Dr. Bowman said, Elevate has the, the revitalized grant. This is super easy to apply for if you go to their website. And it'll pay for half of your sponsorship fee. So um, more industry sponsors, maybe if they couldn't afford to do it in the past, um, they can pay half the cost. And that is it for me. seen us on a video for the past couple semesters. Um, we just want to talk a little bit about skills. It's going to be hosted here at Western Dakota Tech in April. We want to make sure you have those dates. We want to talk a little bit about ways you can help. Um, but I just want to start by saying thank you. When this first went out, we got so many emails of people willing to donate prizes and be judges and help us coordinate the contest. So we're off to a great start already with, with having your assistance. Now we actually have some numbers to share on which contest people will be competing in, so you'll know kind of exactly what we'll be hitting you up for. So we have two welding students that serve as Skilled USA State officers. 
a couple weeks ago, they had the opportunity to go to the legislative shadow day. Uh, it was a really pretty cool experience for them. They got to do some leadership training. Uh, they sat on some committee meetings and got to hang out on the, the house floor. Uh, they were kind of dragging their feet about it at first, but they came back and said, man, it was a really cool experience. They said they've seen some really heated arguments in those committee meetings. <laughs> uh, it was a really good experience. So that's a, a pretty neat part of Skills USA that we don't often see is the professional development side. These are the dates, the 7th and 8th of April. You'll hear from us again about that. Um, and we just kind of wanted to share the tentative schedule. I think when people want to help or, or we ask for your help, we sort of want to know what you're in for. Um, so the biggest thing is to help with the contest. So we need judges, we need um, prize donations. And the contests actually happen in pretty small windows of time um, on Thursday evening from 5 to 7.30 and then again on Friday morning. Um, and you can kind of come as you are able. Uh, some of the bigger contests like welding uh, and auto finishing, that sort of thing might go over both days. Um, but if you're interested in helping, we can kind of plug you into uh, the place that's the best fit. It, your program directors will uh, fill you in on the exact schedule. Uh, for the most part, this is pretty set, but uh, welding is one of the big ones that we're gonna have a longer schedule on Thursday. I think for the most part, Almost all the other contests will just be on uh, Friday morning, so that will be the main commitment. <clears throat> uh, these are the overall registrations for this year. Uh, it's not 100% finalized, but this is pretty much it. Our numbers are a little bit down compared to years past, but that's kind of expected uh, given everything we've gone through the last couple of years with cancellations and snowstorms and COVID and everything else. So it's a, it's a nice start especially for us being at Western Dakota Tech, this is our first time hosting. So it's kind of good that our numbers are down a little bit, I think, but uh, some of the programs are uh, have a lot of contestants, welding, uh, auto, diesel, uh, and electrical trades are some that are pretty well staffed, but we're gonna need some help from industry on a few of those. Uh, one thing we did note uh, this year compared to the past, I guess maybe this is a theme, is robotics and mechatronics are really starting to become more popular where uh, those haven't really been big contests in the past. So uh, those are ones we're still kind of getting our feet wet in and need some help with us as far as some judges on those also. And then I, I just want to point out that um, sort of the benefit of helping, I mean, with, as we mentioned, judging, uh, donations, but we also have a career fair event. So there's some, there's about a three hour window on Friday morning where many of the competitors don't have much to do. They're done with their contests. And so we put together a career fair and sort of a show me your skills activity. It'll be in the commons. Um, so we can have like nail driving contests and dem demonstrations of trainers and things like that. And as an employer at that event or helping out at all, the benefit is that you get to meet the people who are participating in and winning these contests. So this is already something they're interested in. This is already a career field that they're sort of um, either in at one of the colleges or they're heading towards from high school. So it's a really great chance. I and mean, when they announce the winners, the employers kind of line up to talk to those folks. So it's a nice opportunity to get to meet sort of the pipeline of people coming in, but also some of our students that, um, that are about to graduate and you can sort of see their skills and what they have. So there's a benefit to you as well um, for participating, getting to sort of mingle with those students. Uh, one thing I would like to add quick on that too is it's not just technical trade competitions. Uh, I don't know if you've seen there's a lot of speech, uh, interview type competitions, soft skill competitions that we could use some help with. Uh, more people in front of these students in these speech competitions, I think it's a good thing. So uh, it's not just trade stuff that we need help with. Uh, if you're willing or able to help out, if your program director hasn't already contacted you, you can talk to the program directors or you can contact uh, Chandra or myself and let us know if you'd be willing to help out with uh, judging or supplying uh, prizes or helping out in any other way, uh, including the trade show career fair. I think that's all we have. Thank you for the plug on the uh, auction we have going on out there. I think we'll give you a couple of minutes after the meeting ends and I'll announce the winners on that. So please 
<laughs> Grab a couple more beers and then uh, <laughs> put down your oxygen number. Thank you. <laughs>
Danny from our surgical tech program. She didn't know I was gonna call her out today. Um, so she was a winner when she was a student back in 2019. Um, and she's sitting in the audience tonight now as a faculty member for the surgical technology program. So Monica and Emily, just keep in mind, you want to come back later on if you're a faculty member, um, you can do it for sure. So um, for this award, faculty members of the Student Success Center submit recommendations for this nomination. And this year, as you know, we have two outstanding students. And I'm going to brag about each one of them a little bit before they come on stage to accept their award. Um, there's, there's a lot of information that goes into these nomination packets. And for both of these students, the nomination was 12 pages long. So to try to find information and, and keep it um, relatively short was a little challenging because there was a lot of pretty amazing information shared about these students. So our first outstanding student that we would like to recognize is Monica Sherman, who is a computer-aided design student that will be graduating in May. She currently holds a 4.0 GPA and has been a recipient for the Bill Dakota Scholarship, which you've heard a little about today. The John T. McCurvich Foundation Scholarship, the Gifford Memorial Scholarship, and the AGC Building Construction Trade Scholarship. And also, while she's been here at WDT, Monica's been a tutor for our Student Success Center in over seven subject areas, and was recently interviewed by a local newspaper on student mentoring and supplies to her tutoring. Within the endorsement letters for Monica, um, who they were submitted by Jennifer Williams Curl, our librarian and disabilities coordinator, Todd Anderson, one of her faculty members, and then Deanna Gibson, who was one of her classmates. Within those letters, there were a lot of um, amazing words used to describe Monica. So I tried to list as many of them as I could here up on the screen. And before she comes up on stage, I want to read a few portions of the personal statement that she submitted. I strive, strive in school to create good grades while also balancing my personal life as well as multiple jobs. I have found that all my efforts have paid off as I have been able to maintain a 4.0 GPA. I couldn't have gotten where I have without my amazing teachers helping me along the way. My teachers have also been beyond amazing and helped me outside of the class. Over the course of the summer, I had a great opportunity to work with a private client. With the guidance of my teacher, I got to take a napkin sketch that the client created and turn it into a full set of house plans. That was a wonderful experience, and I believe it helped prime me for the next step in my education of entering the architectural career field. I intend to go into the architectural career field of CAD once I've completed my degree because my grandpa was a contractor and imparted a love of building to my mom and she in turn passed it on to me. I am thrilled with the future prospect of working with planning and drawing buildings. I look forward to working with a company that's involved in the architectural field and in the future after gaining experience for a company I am considering the possibility of starting my own business, doing the same private house plan work I did over the summer. So please help me congratulate Monica Fundraising events this year. 
She was the only student on campus to take advantage of the mental health first aid training that was offered to all staff and students, and she's heavily involved in a large variety of community service projects. Emily's letters of endorsement were submitted by Brianna Quinn, one of our student success coaches, Dr. Michael Elston, adjunct instructor and associate medical director for the paramedic program, and Kelsey Stevens, who is one of Emily's classmates. Again, there were many incredible words used to describe Emily, which I've listed up here, and I would like to read a, a portion of her personal statement. When times are stressful and emotions run high, I am a sound person to offer advice with assured privacy. Stress management is a large portion of being successful in paramedicine in which I excel. By being a reliable and consistent student, my peers have turned to me frequently for assistance. I study hard and constantly work toward being the strongest provider that I can be. I've been told that I am the person others wish to be. This is an immense compliment that is very humbling and comes with responsibility that I do not take lightly. I have formed study groups, fundraisers for the MS Club, mental strength in times of need, kindness, compassion, and I am always asking questions. I stand up to bullies, I protect the defenseless, and bring positivity and encouragement wherever I go. I am trusted by my peers because I seek growth, and it makes me a good role model. Once I have attained my associate's degree, I will join the fire academy to work as a fire medic. I will be on the national disaster call list, deploying me nationwide in any event. I will become South Dakota search and rescue specialized in water rescue, rock climbing, and advanced extrication skills. I will become certified, um, a certified rescue diver. I will hold my skills and after five years of experience, I will apply for my Department of Defense background check, giving me the ability to offer, to help in any situation. I will attain a master's degree in paramedicine and work towards training the next generation in paramedicine and search and rescue. What I fear above all else is stagnancy. In the words of Albert Einstein, once you stop learning, you start dying. And though mortality is natural, I never want to stop growing towards the best, being the best I am capable of being. So please help me in recognizing Emily. Thank you. 
well. For this award, all faculty members have an opportunity to submit recommendations to Dr. Bowman on who they feel is the best representation of an outstanding technical instructor. So I think this nomination is pretty special for a faculty member because the nomination actually comes from their peers. This year we would like to recognize Dr. Kelsey Murray, who is the program director for environmental engineering program, the co-program director for the controlled environment agriculture program, and the program director for the pharmacy technician program. So that right there is a lot. And Kelsey says she gets asked frequently on what do all those things have to do with each other? And her reply is that these fields have more in common than one would assume on the surface, and that she has spent her career focusing on the intersection of the natural environment and human health. And now here at WDT, she is provided with the opportunity to teach a wide variety of students in these um, various fields. What I'm gonna show you with this nomination is quite a few pictures. So, um, pictures of Kelsey's work, and then I'll share a little more information um, as I talk through the next couple of slides of what she's working on. So Kelsey has sat on the South Dakota Public Health Association board, including being the vice president for two years. She's the lead campus liaison for the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education. In 2020, she was a presenter at the Global Conference on Sustainability with a presentation on EchoWorks, um, a cooperative e-recycling program, which we'll talk a little bit more here in a second. Also in 2020, Kelsey was a finalist for the Campus Sustainability Achievement Award for the same EchoWorks project. And then in 2021, she again was a finalist for Campus Sustainability Achievement Award for the Planting the Pond project that you'll hear more about shortly. She's also the campus liaison for our B Campus USA designation. She established and operates our on-campus apiary and guides students to continually create and enhance pollinator habitats on campus. And she also teaches students basics in beekeeping and was the recipient of the Farm Credit Services of America Community other community service involvement for Kelsey includes Board of Director for Bear Root Nat Natural Food Cooperative, Board of Director for Live Blue Bee Farms, and currently serves as the co-program manager for EchoWorks. And this is an, an electronics waste recycling facility that's here on campus in conjunction with Black Hills Works. And to date, this program has processed over 100,000 pounds of e waste. Um, and it was, was also the recipient of a South Dakota Community Foundation grant and the Black Hills Community Foundation grant. A few more pictures here to show you. Kelsey has spent the last few years creating quality technical training supplemented by real world experiences to create the core skills and knowledge essential for sustainable development. She has integrated curriculum from the community, providing students with relevant hands-on experience that furthers their planning, team building, and leadership skills while simultaneously benefiting the partnering community. She currently has three grant-funded projects which work to engage and educate the next generation of scientists engineers, and the greater academic communities. The tertiary wastewater treatment through aquaponics project was part of the People, Prosperity, and the Planet Design competition with the Safe and Sustainable Water Resources Program and the EPA. This is a team of environmental engineering, controlled environment ag, electrical trades, CAD, and farm and ranch students and instructors who designed and are currently constructing an aquaponic system to be used in tertiary treatment of wastewater. 
He South Dakota was part of the South Dakota Department of Agriculture block grant and the USDA. This is another interdisciplinary team of environmental engineering, controlled environment ag, electrical trades, CAD, construction, plumbing, HVAC, and farm and ranch management, students and instructors who incorporated hands-on learning into technical training with the ultimate goal of increasing the number of skilled professionals while simultaneously addressing the local and regional food desert in Western South Dakota. They have designed and are currently constructing a geothermal deep winter greenhouse for the use in teaching and community education here on campus. It's right back behind the building. Um, and this is a few pictures, the, the um, planned pictures of the greenhouse design here on this slide. So sometimes you will be able to the greenhouse. And then planting the pond, which is part of the Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Youth Educator Grant Program and the U.S. Department of Ag. Under faculty guidance, students designed, constructed, and implemented a medium-sized aquaponics unit in a local middle school STEM classroom that already had existing um, sustainable agriculture curriculum. And then that curriculum was supplemented with videos created by Kelsey students, and her students also perform weekly environmental monitoring and testing of that system as part of their course. And then in the first few slides, the pictures were enough of a wow factor. Here's a few just of the lab spaces here on campus that Kelsey students work in. Kelsey says, teaching and learning are my passions. I am a professional teacher and a lifelong student. While I have the title of instructor, I learn just as much from my students every year as I teach them. Every day in the classroom with the students is truly a joy. At WDT, I am privileged to be given the academic freedom to pursue lofty goals in the pursuit of educating students. All of the projects I, along with numerous colleagues, implement are used to teach our technical students in many areas of study the skills that they need to be successful in their chosen fields, while also allowing for service learning activities that benefit our local community. While learning their respective technical skills, my students are increasing local food security, through National Award winning Aquaponics Project, through construction of a 100 foot geothermal greenhouse, through an indoor growing space capable of growing 6,000 heads of lettuce, through designing a mobile produce trailer, through collaborations with local food security groups and partnerships with local K-12 classrooms. My students are donating the produce that they grow to a local pay what you can cafe, and they are working for providing free and unlimited produce to our entire student body and their families. I want my students to graduate with competitive technical skills knowing that they contributed to the community in a positive manner. So please help me in congratulating Dr. Kelsey Green.
the program with the most votes moves forward with the campus nomination. This year, our outstanding technical nominee, the uh, technical program nominee, is the Computer Aided Design or CAD program under the direction of co program directors Todd Anderson and James Lovrich. This program equips students with the skills and knowledge necessary to produce accurate technical drawings under industry standard CAD systems. Graduates receive training in a full range of knowledge and skills needed to succeed in the diverse and varied field of drafting and design. This program is widely accepted as the industry standard and qualifying for an entry level position in architectural, civil, and mechanical CAD fields. This um, nomination had four letters of endorsement from myself as the college administrator. Dave Stafford from Dave Stafford Architecture, who is one of the advisory board members. Jeremy Altman from Architecture Incorporated, who is an employer of a program completer. And then Kristen Weedy, who was a 20, um, 2020 program graduate. Based on comments made within those four letters of endorsement, the program was recognized as outstanding for many reasons including the experience and proactivity of its faculty members, excellent job placement rate of graduates, local community service activities and internship opportunities, a quick response to industry needs, constant reevaluation of the program curriculum to save industry current, employer satisfaction in the graduates that have been hired, strong advisory board support, strong soft skills of collaboration and communication among its graduates, a seamless transition to online learning during the COVID pandemic, and numerous collaborative activities for CAT students to work on joint projects with other college programs such as plumbing, environmental engineering, and electrical trades. The program has some pretty unique community service projects that I thought I would mention. You heard earlier about planting the pond. This was a joint project between CAD Electrical Trades and Environmental Engineering um, to bring a functional aquaponics garden to East Middle School. The One Heart Coffee Shop. The CAD program worked with One Heart to design a coffee shop as part of their transitional housing project. For the Abbott House, CAD students helped to design and develop plans for the Abbott House organization for the New Rapid City Transitional Housing Facility. The Tiny House Initiative, the program worked with the city to help develop low-income housing to try to help tackle the affordable housing shortage. The Southern Hills Community Recreation Initiative, the program helped design a concept for a rec center in Hot Springs. The project took place over a two-year period from 2017 to 19. For high school engagement, the program is active, actively engaged with their CTE counterparts at local high schools by providing in-class demonstrations on various CAD-related subjects. Corporate engagement, the program assisted in developing and implementing a condensed training program through Corp Ed for Caterpillar. The purpose of the program was to help Caterpillar recruit qualified individuals to work at the Black Hills Engineering Design Center. For public engagement, the program regularly engages with individuals from the community needing help with design of various projects, such as houses, buildings, invent inventions, or machinery, and students gain valuable knowledge of the design process while working with actual clients. And then for student engagement, the program holds a really fun annual drag race among its second year students. Um, they compete to determine the best design and the fastest car. So students design a 3D print model vehicles using CAD software. The event is here in the, or in the event center. It looks like a race car track in here. Um, it's widely publicized and regularly attended, and students learn a lot of skills including process of design and manufacturing, mechanical principles, and sports teaching. And lastly, I put one quick comment up here for you to read. I think this 
um, captures the true core of the CAD program. This was from a 2020 graduate, and the, the core of the program is that it has two incredible leaders who are passionate about educating the next generation. So let's congratulate Todd and James and their program. Despite the high need in Western South Dakota, 
The department is also short-staffed in nurses and other technical skilled employees. So in conjunction with our scholarship office, the department presented a proposal to the county commission to request additional budget funds for the department to sponsor an LPM student with plans to sponsor students in automotive tech, diesel tech, welding, electrical, plumbing, and other fields in the future. The commissioners were impressed with this proposal to partner with the Bill Dakota Scholarship and approved any Pennington County Department to be funded from the county for Bill Dakota Scholarship matching funds for students at WDT. This county funding has generated further support for other employer partnerships for the scholarship, leading to a noticeable increase in the overall number of employer partnerships over the past year and twice the number of students receiving high grade Bill Dakota scholarships at WBT. So let's congratulate Pennington County Chiefs say a few things. I'm going to use some of Tom's 45 minutes that he left up on the stage. <laughs> Maybe he didn't leave any time. He has probably shots to get off to, so we'll get, we'll, I'll make it short. But we really appreciate our partnership that we have with the folks out at Western Dakota Tech. It's really, really mutually beneficial. And uh, we've heard a lot of great things tonight, but I think we should take a minute to thank Western Dakota Tech and their staff and faculty and their students for the partnership that we have for our, in our community and for the work that they do to understand the needs of our employers and help us recruit people to come and stay and live here right in western South Dakota. So thank you. Okay, so I told you I'd break about the VT and all of those recognized tonight most definitely made it very easy to do. So thank you again for attending. Um, Dr. Bowman is going to come up really quickly just to share a few closing words, and then I think Troy has some sign-on option winners to announce. Thank you. Thank you all very much for your time and for your attendance tonight. We also want to just acknowledge the fact that our advisory board members are incredible resources for our programs. Um, I also want to remind you that if you haven't put your bid in on the welding program sign and option items, you need to do it really fast because I think Troy is walking up towards the front and perhaps we'll be here in a second. Okay, there, there's some arm wrestling going on. Okay, good. Perfect. Well, they'll raise a lot of money that way. So anyway, I want to thank you all for coming out tonight and for um, making our spring advisory board meeting incredibly fantastic. And I also want to thank Tom Johnson for coming out and sharing the information, the wealth of knowledge about the economic situation here in uh, Western South Dakota. So thank you all very much. I think Troy is going to come up in about five minutes or whenever the arm wrestling is over and announce the winners of the silent auction. So. Have a great evening, waiting in anticipation to hear if you won the archives. Thank you. Thank you.